Honest with you, we used to talk about it a lot, but uh, most of the people my age are gone or moved away or dead, right. <laughs> you know. Right. And so most of the generation I grew up with is just or have moved away, and nothing is hardly ever said about it. I mean, and probably the history of the leper will die with us too. It was a tragedy. It was. It is. Uh, um, it's a. It's a very interesting story, and it's a tragedy. Um, it's part of our history, though. And uh, um, yeah, I'm. I'm reading now a story called "The Worst Hard Times," and it's about the the Dust Bowl, surviving the Dust Bowl, and it's just. It. It's amazing, what the human species can endure in order to survive. Yeah. And I think George is just, uh, is, is an early uh, 20th century example of that. That started my uh, journey, my investigation into the life of the leper of Pickens, who I later found out his name is George Rashid. We pronounced it Rashad instead of Rashid, um, and that came out of Pickens. I don't know how did the, you notice the people pronouncing it over there nowadays. Is it Rashad or is it Rashid? So with George Rashid, uh, his, his, he came in on the Amsterdam uh, through Ellis Island, and he spelled Beirut, B-E-Y, R O U T A. That's the French spelling. Okay. That's the French spelling because it's B E I R U T. But every, he did everything with the French spelling. Yeah. So what does the that? The was the French spelling. So that indicates kind of where he was from. No. Yeah. Or it indicates French. what the Irishman wants it to indicate. Oh, uh, gotcha. Getting off the boat. Everything that people don't realize, but their names and everything depended on the Irishman and his accuracy and spelling. Wow. And his ear. <laughs> so and there was always a good Irishman for those coming off the boat. The first Syrian immigrants arrived in the United States from Ottoman Syria. Most of them came from Christian villages around Mount Lebanon before the creation of the Republic of Lebanon. Early immigrants settled mainly in eastern United States the majority of immigrants from Mount Lebanon began to refer to themselves as Lebanese instead of Syrians. Many Christian Syrians had immigrated to the United States seeking religious freedom and escape from Ottoman rule. We, we, it says in this book written by Frank Sacron, um, who was a, a, a a brilliant family member whose name was Rashid, and um, um, they changed it Ellis Island because they asked this young boy whose father was the town drunk, what is your name? And he said Ibn, which means son of the Sakran, the drunk, son of the drunk. So they, <laughs> sa they spelled his name S-A-K-R-A-N. So Frank Sakran, who was one of our yeah, most brilliant, <laughs> brilliant, yeah. members of our family, and who's written numerous books and wrote the story of the Roots of the Rashids, was known as the Sacron family, the Sacron family. When they got off the boat in New York, they asked people where they could go. And they showed them these mountain ranges of West Virginia. And their logic was simply, well, they couldn't have a store in every town, so it'd be the right place to go in the mountains 
George Rashid, a pioneer peddler, made his way to America in 1901 to make a better life. George was part of a family renowned for their prominent status in Syrian society and later for their vast achievements as American citizens. George also happened to be the first Rashid to venture onto West Virginia soil. I was working as a reporter at the newspaper in Oak Hill, Fayette Tribune, and someone had told me, I don't know how it, it got connected to me, but the woman who was running the, an, like an international organization for leprosy was headquartered on Main Street in Oak Hill. How, how you know, random how, how random is that? But you know, as a reporter looking for an interesting story, that's one you, you, you've kind of got to do. I believe she was originally from Hawaii and she was in Southern West Virginia because her husband was a superintendent with the Park Service or high ranking with the Park Service, which is based in Glenjean. So, you know, I go do the stories, very nice woman, interesting, you know, had a lot of, uh, had a lot of, you know, interesting artifacts and interesting stories about what it was like to have leprosy, you know, how marginalized those people were, what it meant to, you know, what, what it meant to them to be shuttled off to a colony, which is, you know, kind of an awful term for it, but, you know, just kind of, I mean, she had a very wide-ranging spectrum of, you know, whatever you would have about leprosy. So I do the story, I go home, and my dad said, did she mention your cousin? And I said, no, why would she mention my cousin? She said, well, there's, you know, we think the first rash who, come, who had come to West Virginia was a guy named George, I, I, learned, I, I since learned, who, um, who suffered from leprosy. Came in on the railroad and had sort of a shuttled all around the state and apparently must have ended up, you know, up, up, in, the, up in the Elkins area. But, you know, that, that was the first and last time he ever mentioned it. And I re he's, he's since passed, and I regret never having, you know, questioned him a little further about that. But that was the first I heard of, of, of this guy. Years and years ago, I heard about his leprosy and uh, as an honest statement I don't think many want to be connected to leprosy right and uh, if there's anybody that knows anything more than we know they have not shared it with the family I can understand that George Rashid came from a place where family tradition and status were synonymous with honor. The early Syrian pioneers were obsessed with public image. How the pioneer presented his image and how he was perceived by others mattered deeply. Fear of shame was linked in the Syrian mind with family honor. On July 30, 1901, the New York Tribune published an article about Syrians in New York, reading in part, the Syrians who have come to America to live have one chief objective, to become good American citizens. Also, on July 30, 1901, George Rashid came to America via the Holland American Line, Amsterdam. When uh, Dr. Cunningham, who was the at the time, the oldest living physician in the United States, uh, or so the story went, he was 103 years old, and his big case was uh, a guy that apparently had leprosy and lived uh, in a boxcar, in, a, in a, a Baltimore and Ohio Railroad boxcar uh, at a place called Pickens, which was uh, at the time, back in 1906, I found out later, uh, was the end of the line for the B&O Railroad. I was pretty young, I, I don't know, but it, I doubt if I was 10 the first time I heard the story. But it was part of the folklore of the whole family, so I've heard it more than once. Well, the reason I started to research this topic was because in a general conversation with my aunt, uh, we started talking about the leper 
and she said it was real. I because after I'd grown up, I thought, well, th that's so inhumane. No one would let any person live in a box car. But indeed, it was a true story. Uh, that was about three years ago. That was when uh, Carrie's brother, Alan and Sophie, was from Texas, up to, and they was with uh, some friends. They stayed there most of the time, and he, he said, do you know about the leopard down in Pickens? And I said, no. He said, do you want to go see it? So we went down and, and looked at the, the grave, you know, and the marker, and I thought, oh boy, I said, what happened? He, he came from Maine, and, uh, and there is a period in there that's, um, you know, it's not a lot of details about from the time he entered the United States until he ended up in, in Enterprise as I could. But now you've got some more information that confirms that or maybe sheds more light on his travels from Waterville to Enterprise to Philippi uh, to Elkins. He came over with a group of 13 uh, Maronites. They went to a, an address on Lehigh Street in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and that particular area was uh, a place where the Maronites were colonizing at the time. I didn't have any information about him at all. I decided the best way to research this was to uh, go out and actually talk to people who might know the story. So I was very lucky to have found folks who would talk to me about what their grandparents mostly had told them about the story. There was also another story written by uh, Wayne Sheets in a 1996 edition of Golden Seal magazine, uh, West Virginia magazine, and that had a wonderful story about George. Our entertainment when we were small uh, was these old retired men that used to gather on the store porch down there in Pickens and what tales they could tell. And I mean, uh, some of them were pretty ornery and then some of them were just entertaining. I, what was true and what wasn't, I, I don't know, were. And they finally brought him to Pickens because this was the farthest outpost that they had. Well, when he first came in, they uh, put him up down below Pickens, about a mile down below Pickens, at a place that they called the Hanging Rock. The best I could find out, if I remember correctly, his tie with the B&O was uh, uh, simply um, that he he climbed on a coal car to, and he got as far as Cumberland. And they well, he was he was shuttled, shuttled all over Central West Virginia on the train. Yeah, in a box car. Oh. They had him in a box car and. Uh, when they brought him in here, they had they had brought the tent and everything with him. The B and O more or less took responsibility for him, okay. and they put the tent up down at the Hanging Rock, which it's it's all grown up now. It, it you can make out where the rock is, yeah. but it's especially in the summertime. Now in the in the spring or fall, you might be able to get or winter time, you might be able to get a good picture of. It. You know, back then your history didn't follow you. On the other hand, what they had, what they did know, may have been and possibly was wrong. Uh, it would have been hyped way out of proportion. But he had always wanted to. They said he wanted to go home to bathe in the River Jordan to think it would cure his leprosy. Well, they were. Yeah, he 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 
he uh, firmly believed that, and that was his mission when he left Elkins, was to get to Massachusetts. To, and, and he had friends up there, supposedly, that would help him get, a, get on board a ship and get back to, to uh, the Middle East. And he believed that if he could swim in the Jordan River, he would be healed. However, the, his article was a great beginning point for my research. And what I've, uh, I mean, what I've found out is completely different than what I thought it would be. His age was way off for everybody because even out at Pickens, you know, the uh, stone that they put up made him, it made him about 43 years old. 1867, I think they said he was born. I think it's in the photograph there on the, uh, on his headstone. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know that. He was he wasn't as old then as uh, as as we thought. I found uh, over 233 articles about George and his journey uh, in from Elkins, West Virginia, in June 1906 uh, to Pickens, West Virginia, in October October 20th, 1906. Uh, when he, around the time he supposedly died. So there was a lot of information there. I found a lot of information from old newspapers and congressional hearings, uh, and also from medical journals. Actually, the first medical journal in West Virginia uh, was originated in August 1906, the first edition. Uh, premiered and a story was in it called uh, The True Story of the Syrian Leper. George's case was of constant concern to the West Virginia Medical Society. In the premier edition of the West Virginia Medical Journal, Dr. Golden, Secretary of the West Virginia Medical Society, responds to Dr. Thomas Dedman's criticism in his journal. Under the heading Senseless Cowardice, you comment on the alleged ill treatment to which this leper has been and still is subjected. I'm not in a position to offer any correction to that part of your comment on the treatment which this man has received in other states for the only source of information I have is a sensational daily press but I am in a position to state that as far as this concerns the wilds of West Virginia, you are in error. As many of the newspapers reported that his, his, um, his name, instead of being George Rashid, R-A-S-H-I-D, was George Rossett, R-O-S-S-E-T-T, -T, or Rossi, because that, that's what folks would have heard with his broken English, with his accent, Rashid. My father had an accent still when he died, but was self-taught to read and write and all that. And I used to apologize for him. Oh. And then I finally made up my mind that this is my father. I don't make any apology. He is who he is. Dr. W. W. Golden from Elkins was considered to be a top doctor in the country. So he could very well have been making his way to see Dr. Golden to see what he could do about, you know, this, this skin condition. He come into Elkins from New York. He, he had a brother up there that was uh, in, I understand he was sold carpets and he wore gloves to, so people couldn't see his hands. So after he was diagnosed by Dr. Golden, then Dr. Irons, who was another prominent doctor in Elkins, J.C. Irons, who was also the mayor of Elkins at one point in time and the director of the public uh, health in Elkins, and looked at him and said, again, said, yes, I agree, I concur. After the medical society uh, deemed George all, all agreed that he had leprosy. He was taken into quarantine by Dr. Irons, who uh, quarantined him to the what was then the county fairgrounds, 
uh, for approximately uh, a week or a week and a half. At, and the Syrian community found out what was happening to him and immediately started to take up funds uh, to have him sent back to Lebanon, which is what George wanted to do. The disease uh, is contagious, I guess, but it takes, uh, you know, it takes a relatively lengthy period of exposure uh, before you can contact it. He arrived in 1901, and the condition apparently did not manifest until uh, 1904 or 5. The Syrian community, headed up by Charles Amian, who was a prominent grocer in Wheeling, had been actively working to get him uh, a ticket and also to get Syria and the United States to agree to the terms of, of George's return. So uh, his brother from Elkins and he got on a train to Cumberland. The brother was carrying the money because... Back then, they didn't wait for some government official and for all the bureaucracy, the wheels of bureaucracy to turn before they did something. They did things then to protect themselves as they knew best. what was best to do. Yeah. And, I, and I think that was the situation here. The CNO, uh, the CNO folks in Harrisburg um, and the Pennsylvania Health Department, you know, they they uh, they didn't know what to do with him, and so finally the BNO said, "Well, you know, we'll just ship him to the most remote point on the BNO line, which at the time, and probably always was Pickens. Uh, if you look at if yeah, if you look at a map and see, you know, you understand where Pickens is located." Um, and I don't say that in a demeaning way. I, that Pickens is a beautiful little town. He was quarantined there at Cumberland, and Dr. Fulton from the Maryland um, uh, Public Health was notified that the leper was there. We don't hear anything else about the brother at that point in time, uh, but Dr. Fulton uh, went out to see George uh, and at Cumberland. He had to come from Baltimore to get, go see George, so that took some time to get there. Uh, then he quarantined him. Dr. Fulton became very angry. He did not know Dr. Golden or Dr. Irons in West Virginia. And he assumed that the doctors in West Virginia, that he assumed that George was living in West Virginia, was living in Elkins, and that he had acquired the leprosy there and that the West Virginia doctors were trying to shun their responsibility and send him to Maryland. He was on his way to his far eastern home, where he hoped to end his days with his own people, but was discovered in a Maryland town, imprisoned for a time in a freight car, shipped east and then west, and finally dropped by the railway officials in a desolate region in West Virginia. Dr. Thomas Stedman's account in the journal Medical Record from August 18, 1906.
there might be 50 people wow. left there. So when the leper was there, when they brought him in, what? How many do you think? Was I would uh, just guess, and I'd say there's probably over a thousand people, wow. a thousand to fifteen hundred somewhere in there. And were they were transplanted? Uh, the lumber company, they uh, Webster County, a lot of them from Webster County, Upshur County, uh, because the B and O was the standard gauge railroad, and this was the farthest outpost that they. The B, that was on the B&O. But all of the logs, like from all the surrounding areas, was brought into Pickens as far away as, uh, well, Hacker Valley. They come to Pickens because they had no railroad in Hacker Valley. But from Hacker Valley, they, everything come to Pickens, Big Sugar Creek, Back Fork, miles and miles around, everything come to Pickens to be sold. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that they imprisoned him so to speak uh, they, they, I, they did put a fence around it and there's there's uh, conflict as to what the fence how it was constructed how high it was uh, I think the people in Pickens uh, were you know they weren't going to do a whole lot to help him because they were scared of him by August 8th Reports surfaced indicating that the federal government was getting involved. The case finally has been brought to the attention of the United States authorities, writes one reporter, and orders have been issued that Rossi be visited and examined by a surgeon of the Marine Hospital Service and a Syrian interpreter. In mid-August, Dr. Cunningham visited George, took his picture and wrote, First visit was 7 a.m. 8-13-1906. Rashid was sitting in his tent on some railroad ties for a bed, declaring he would leave if he did not get better here and had a guard at night to keep up a fire. I was not much afraid of George, but my professional duties prevented me from getting too close with the leper. I sat down near him and tried to have a friendly talk and learn all I could from him, as I had read much of him in the papers. I decided to move George to a field about a fourth of a mile to the new camp near the Y to be nearer to Pickens for more convenience and protection. Public sentiment was getting high and there were many threats of violence. They were scared of, the, of his caretakers, uh, uh, but on the other hand, I don't think they met him any harm. In an exclusive interview, Philip Cosman, George's nurse, gave a graphic narrative which was printed in the October 25th edition of the Randolph Enterprise. Cosman recalled his stay at Pickens for the most part was a good one. He had found that the people were kind and helpful. Cosman recalled that he believed trouble began in Pickens as a result of the fear of one man. Cosman recalled, I reached Pickens September 7th and found board at the Mayo House. Oki Kane, who was boarding at the same place, objected to my presence, claiming that I would transmit the disease to other boarders. Now, the transients is a different story. You know, they, you know, they all got together. They were down at that bar that night, you know, and they, they all decided, I think there was about, I don't know, 16, 15, 16 of them decided to go see Doc Cunningham and say, you got to get this, you have to get this guy out of here. And, uh... Cunningham showed them the barrel of that 38, and they changed their mind. Reports were issued that Mr. Gossman was roaming about the town of Pickens too much and began receiving death threats. Mr. Gossman was with George approximately three weeks before he was shot at and run out of town. Cosman stated that on September 22nd, Dr. Cunningham moved George closer to town. He recalled that he and George were shot at that night and that threats were made to use dynamite at their camp. Cosman said that on September 30th, he was shot at again on his way to church. On October 2nd, Cosman claimed that while going to the store for supplies and to talk with Dr. Cunningham, a man grabbed him and said, It would be better for you to leave this town. When Cosman asked why, the threat was repeated. 
Cosman then recalled that when he attempted to talk to Dr. Cunningham, Kane grappled with him and struck him in the left eye. He said, Dr. Cunningham interfered, but a crowd gathered around him. People whom Cosman felt were friendly to him before were what he referred to as inflamed with anger. They brought him up what they called the Wyatt. It's where the train turned. The tr track come up like this and then back into a hole like that. Yeah. And then when it come out, it was turned like the engine up the hollow instead of down the hall. Okay. And then, well, but they built a little shanty for him there. And he lived there, I guess, up till he died. Now, they, they built a fence around uh, his shanty down there so he couldn't oh, wow. get out. Yeah. And they also, well, they said it was this rumor that they had him chained, but they said it was just a rumor that they had him chained up there. I never heard the fence till I saw in your article that uh, I just assumed that he pretty much stayed in the boxcar, but I don't know. I, I, I you know, I, I really felt sorry for the guy. Yeah. I couldn't help uh, but feel sorry for him. You know, it was something that happened uh, totally out of his control. Well, I, I, I admire George a great deal for his courage with what, with the disease, because he wouldn't let people, he knew that he had a disease that was uh, contagious to some extent, and he would tell the little ones, unclean, unclean, you know, and he wouldn't let them come near him. There he now is abandoned by his fellow men and crying for someone to shoot him and end his misery. Better almost would it be to heed the wretch's prayer and end his misery with a bullet. Dr. Thomas Stedman's account. You know, it's so sad that um, that he had to, his life was so tragic and uh, it, just, it was just a life wasted because people didn't understand. And we, we heard it as children and never factored it in to our own lives. Because what they essentially did was actually teach people. Where did they confine them? In Pickens. Pickens. Yeah. You gotta admire the people for even putting a barbed wire fence around them. Really, the grown-ups were probably more scared to be around him, but they said the kids would go down and said some of the kind children yeah. The book says some of the kind children of Pickens would go down and pitch apples to him. I bet they pitched them. Uh, other than being afraid of him, I don't think the people of Pickens meant him any harm other than those that were transient. The workers, the people that moved from job to job. The people who were indigenous to Pickens uh, were reportedly very good to him. They fed him, you know, someone guarded him. Uh, but what ended up happening, you had those, you know, 150 or so families from Pickens who had immigrated there and settled the area. And then you had 1,400 transient lumberjacks uh, and people who worked various positions in the mills. So these transients, many of them reportedly were not happy about George being there, uh, not only because they were prejudiced against uh, people coming into the country, but they were prejudiced because of the conceived idea that he was contagious with leprosy. You know, but, the good and the bad happened to him. Cosman recalled that Dr. Cunningham remonstrated with the people, assuring them that there could be no danger from his presence as the disease was not contagious. He said they did not heed him, According to Cosman, the crowd started yelling and saying, Our textbook is the Bible in which it was declared the leper is an outcast, and the Bible comes before the physician's textbook. On Saturday, October 6, 1906, reports indicate that Dr. Cunningham wired Governor Dawson that unless law enforcement was sent to Pickens immediately, he feared for George's life and also his own. 
Dr. Cunningham indicated that he could only hold off the crowd so long. On Wednesday, October 10th, the Randolph County Sheriff reportedly visited Pickens to check on George and reportedly found him to be fine and the crowd calm. One week later, on Friday, October 19th, George reportedly died of a heart condition. Other reports indicated that he might have been poisoned. I don't think he was cremated. I, I, I don't, uh, but, uh, because if they cremated him, they probably would have just left him in the box car and cremated him right there, and there would have been no need to have hooks to pick him up. And of course, Doc Cunningham and uh, a, they, I think a funeral director, somebody over from over about Beverly, they took care. They they dug the grave themselves, and uh, but some of the townspeople didn't want him buried in or close to anything. So when they buried him, they had the, the coffin, which is probably just a wooden box. They put quicklime in on top of him, which would. Yeah. dissolve anything and everything right. and then they buried him and then put more quick quick lime on top of him my mother was Virginia Zen and she was born and reared in Huttonsville and her father was a undertaker and that's where I got the story from was because of his involvement our tennis Worthington Zen. All right, and he had a, a funeral home there. Yeah, and in those days, undertakers did other things too. He was a cabinet maker and a carpenter and builder. Later years, he had a place in Elkins, but when they were small, it was they went to the homes, did the embalming most of the time in the home, took the casket with them and. Did he build the casket? Yeah, most of the time, yeah. He used to go all over the country and bury people and take care of them. In those days, you know, hardly anybody even went to the church. They were, funerals were at the house. And uh, and I'm assuming, since it was that far away, that somebody got word to him somehow to get to come and do that. And my mother said they were so afraid that they didn't touch George. They used clasper hooks to pick him up and because they were so terrified of catching leprosy. And then the story she told me was after they removed him from the boxcar that the railroad pushed him in there on that they burned that car. Well, about all for most things he did was just on a, um, you know, carry a few bottles of embalming fluid and, of course, uh, if he was taking a casket, he would take that, but... Uh... Doc was in, you know, helped get him out after he passed away and to put him in his coffin and stuff. Of course, he wasn't embalmed or nothing. Dr. Golden was the only doctor in Randolph Tucker Barber Medical Society who had ever seen a case of leprosy. He was the first to diagnose George, and although Dr. Golden's Medical Society colleagues concurred with his diagnosis, it was noted that none of them had ever seen a case of leprosy. No symptoms were ever noted besides the lesions on George's hands. Dr. Cunningham never recorded George's death in the Randolph County Courthouse although he appeared to be meticulous at record keeping as seen by the chronicle of deaths that he recorded throughout the years. Um, I had a guy, we were in a funeral in Ohio um, and we, we were in, in the church and we were standing, uh, all of us in the, in the foyer in the back of the church waiting to be seated and this guy comes up to me and he's, you know, I'm not very tall, I'm only 5'11 and he was about 5'6 or so five seven maybe and he just comes storming up to me and he says your article was all wrong 
been a journey. It yeah, really has. And, and you know, the nice thing about it is it isn't over with it. And I hope that it does convey a message. George reportedly worked in a paper mill from 1901 through 1906. In 1909, three years after George's death, a paper mill worker presented with skin lesions, seeing a doctor, asking for help. The doctor gave him a hurried diagnosis of leprosy and quarantined him. It was later found that he had mycosis caused from black ash he encountered at his work in the mill. Mycosis is often misdiagnosed as leprosy. Many historic and modern studies have found that mycosis is a prevalent problem with mill workers. Dr. Golden was the only doctor to see a case of leprosy and no diagnostic tests were completed to support the diagnosis. Leprosy did not heal quickly at the time, yet George's nurse, Philip Cosman, reported that he was improving. Given this new information, it is very possible that George did not have leprosy, but suffered from an occupational disease. The Randolph Enterprise said of George's death, By George's death, a problem which has bothered a railroad, a county, a state, and almost a national government has been solved.